Can Xi Jinping's China pull it off? Can happy pictures of a torch relay reduced to 72 hours, tightly cropped images of top-level competitions make the world forget about, well, empty seats, the COVID bubble, the artificial snow, the tight security, and the pressure on sponsors over human rights abuses in Xinjiang and Hong Kong? The stakes are high for a Chinese president who in the fall is said to break the unwritten rule on term limits and become the nation's longest serving leader since Mao. The Beijing Olympics of 2022, a reminder of just how much has changed since the Beijing Summer Olympics of 2008. Back then, it seemed like the celebration of China joining the fold of developed nations on the inevitable road to, if not liberal democracy, at least a free market economy that's open to the world. With Vladimir Putin the main attraction among foreign dignitaries at Friday's opening ceremony, what will these games symbolize? And what about the athletes themselves? After all, the games are marketed as a celebration of universal values of peace and performance through sports with, yes, a pinch of national pride. What's left of the Olympic spirit in 2022. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the Olympics in a bubble. With us, she won two Olympic medals in alpine skiing. Florence Mazdana, color commentator for a partner station Eurosport. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. Uh, Shun Yan Li is the founder of Feta Consulting. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Uh, he's France 24's now former uh, Beijing correspondent. You're back, what, two months now? About that, three months. Three months, three months back from, from Beijing. Charles Pellegrin uh, gracing us with his presence. And from St. Louis, anthropologist uh, Susan Brownell, lecturer at the University of Missouri at St. Louis. Uh, you've been going to China since 1985 when you were a student and a champion heptathlete. Uh, winter Games, your thing? You like them? Well, Really, I was a track and field athlete, so summer games were my thing. But I also love figure skating. So, yes, I love them both. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter. Hashtag F24 debate. Thanks to the excellent work of the Beijing 2022 organizing committee, everything is in place for safe and outstanding Olympic Winter Games. All's well on the eve of the Games as the IOC president speaks and China's president officially opened a session of the International Olympic Committee. They're now the uh, second Games to take place in a bubble, the hosts cramming in as many stars as possible into a, well, a very short torch relay. Here you see a Hong Kong action movie star, Jackie Chan. I feel very proud and lucky to be a torchbearer for two Olympics. This is my fourth Olympics. I'm very happy and I'm also very cold. So Charles Pellegrin, the, the torch relay reduced to three days, but nonetheless there is this feeling of Olympics excitement that's, that's, that's building. Well, absolutely, and you know, Beijing's been very excited about uh, these uh, these events. So obviously, the, the the Chinese capital, the first city to host both the Winter and Summer Olympics. Uh, it's been a bit of an ordeal to organize uh, these games uh, in the context of the of the pandemic, the COVID nineteen pandemic, and especially in the context of China's. Uh, strategy to deal with the virus that's been quite different from many other countries, the zero COVID strategy mix, which uh, basically means that China, in effect, has been basically closed off from the rest of the world, a fortress, uh, really, uh, for two years now. I mean, I was there uh, for most of it. It was impossible to leave the country, but within it, it was this weird sort of very comfortable bubble where you could sort of live your life free of any fear of the virus, unless you were one of those people, those very few people in the grand scheme of things that was uh, caught with, uh, with COVID. And so organizing this, this closed loot system, uh, this bubble to get uh, the world's athletes and world's delegations to come to Beijing is a huge uh, enterprise. And um, it seems like they're going to uh, pull it off, at least on uh, the, the logistical side of things. But this is a very strange Olympics with uh, the taking place in this sort of parallel universe, which is not really China, is this Olympic bubble uh, that ex exists completely separate from China's wider population and where some of the people from China have to go into quarantine in order to work there. And a lot of them are working in hazmat suits. It's an extremely strange experience, especially for the foreigners going to China uh, today to, and who are experiencing the zero COVID strategy for the first time. Yeah, the, the people in hazmat suits. And by the way, the games have already featured their first controversy involving an athlete 
Organizers fir at first took away a tearful Kim Maimelans for isolation, even though the Belgian skeleton racer was no longer testing positive for COVID. After she took to Instagram with this plea, it turned out that it was a mix-up and the possible medal contender was allowed out eventually. Maximum. Um, it seems like the video and especially also the efforts of my Olympic committee have really paid off. At uh, 11.35 p.m. Uh, there was a knock on my door and I was escorted to the Olympic Village. I am now in a wing that's just isolation, but at least I'm back in the village. I feel safe and um, I'll be able to train a little better here. Um, so thank you all. We understand that COVID measures are necessary to preserve the safety and health of participants in the Olympic Games. But we believe that in this approach, the athlete must remain central. We continue to work tirelessly to continue to improve Kim's situation, and we remain in constant contact with her. Florence Mazdana, what was your reaction to that story? Oh, it's, I think it's terrible for the athletes. Uh, I think it's very hard. Every athletes are very, very stressed. Uh, they, for every movement, every people they are meeting, they, they think, okay, uh, I have to, to stay away from everybody. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult and it's very strange. But at least for her, finally, it may be going to be a happy end for her. And I'm really happy that uh, they find at least a, a good solution. And the, the Olympics for athletes in any case take place in a bubble, do they not? Because you're in the Olympic village, right, during, throughout the competition. And uh, uh, when you uh, won your medals at the 92-98 Games, were you in that, in, that, in that bubble that obviously not as draconian as the one we're seeing now? But what was it like, the, the mood during the Games themselves? Well, I think it's completely different. It's um, it was uh, normally the Olympic Games. You you are all together. It's a bubble, yeah, in the village. You're you're between athletes, but uh, there's a real life uh, enjoyment here. It's going to be very very strange. I uh, I talk with some athletes, and uh, they are very happy to be there. They are very happy to be able to 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 race or to uh, yeah to um, compete in a few days. But um, the infrastructure, everything is incredible. But at least the atmosphere is so quite so strange. It looks like it's uh, they couldn't imagine that they're going to race, uh, they're going to compete, and that the Olympic Games are going to be like that. It's so it's so strange. And uh, but is it the anyway. same? Is it the same as the Tokyo Olympics, where also there were no. the, those draconian measures? No, I think it's not exactly the same. Uh, first, the um, uh, it was more open uh, after 15, 14 days uh, with no with testing every day, of course. And before we, we could we could go in the village, walk and go on the on the site, different site. We don't have to to show every day uh, where where we go. Uh, we could move a little bit around, and then you could you could go in the in the city after 14 days. You could take the uh, transportation, everything. Now it's it, they, like they go on the on the Olympic Village, and they will go to their race and then back. They won't be able to see other events and anything. But uh, anyway, they knew that, so they are prepared for that and they are prepared to race and they want to to express themselves during the the competition. They want to express themselves in the competition, even if there are, of course, fewer people in the stands. And as Charles Pelgrin was saying, uh, that mix between those that are inside the bubble and the rest of China, which is outside of it, our Hong Kong correspondent Oliver Ferry filed this report. The mission of these volunteers is to whip up some Olympic atmosphere in Beijing but they're playing entirely to a domestic audience with few foreign tourists to welcome. Compared to 2008, there aren't many people because of COVID. But we're enthusiastic all the same, even if there are fewer tourists. Beijing this year is a city split in two. The Chinese capital on one side of the fence, the Olympic bubble on the other, each strictly separated. 
The opening ceremony will take place in the Olympic Stadium, also known as the Bird's Nest. Like all other venues and the Olympic Village, it's behind barricades. There's no possible contact between the two worlds. Even the roads are divided, with this one reserved for Olympic vehicles. This police video warns the public not to intervene in traffic accidents involving vehicles on Olympic roads. No contact with people inside the bubble is permitted. Within the bubble, some 300 cases have been recorded. Every athlete must undergo testing each day. If the test positive, there's a risk of missing out on competition. It all hinges on a positive test. Psychologically, that means extra stress on top of the stress of the competition itself. COVID has deprived the people of Beijing of the Olympic spectacle. Tickets cannot be bought and the authorities advise against travelling outside the city. Winter sports fans console themselves by going ice skating. It would be better if there were bigger crowds to support the athletes. Everyone is happy that China is hosting the Olympics again, despite the inconvenience. We can understand the pandemic restrictions. We can still watch the games on TV. And these games will be on TV only. The city will remain cut off from the bubble until the end of the Paralympics on the 14th of March. Chen Yanli, your reaction to that report? Um, there are some constraints uh, due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. I think we need to manage that and to adapt to that. Uh, so the anti-COVID measures uh, may look very strict, you know, in the eyes of the Westerners uh, you know, during the uh, Olympic uh, Games in France 18. Mazen, I was saying they're even stricter than Tokyo. Yeah, uh, but I think at the end, the objective is to ensure the safety and the health of the uh, athletes and also to ensure the smooth running of the Olympic Games, yeah, uh, to, to reduce uh, or avoid any possible contagions. Now, you heard Xiao mention how yeah. uh, China has opted for this um, uh, zero ch COVID travel bubble yeah. for the whole country. Uh, uh, that depends on the on the city. Yeah, we uh, where you have to if you're if you're mm -hmm. traveling into the country, you have to uh, self isolate for a very long time before you can go out. Other Two or three that, weeks, I think, yeah. Other countries that are doing the same are yeah. beginning to lift it. The case of New Zealand comes to mind. Mm -hmm. When do you think that that will be also the case in China? Will it be after the games? Will it be after the fall when you have the Communist Party uh, 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 meeting and the, the re-election, the expected re-election of Xi Jinping? I think it's very difficult to predict that because that will also depend on the situation in the Western countries. Uh, you know, on the Western world as well. Um, and uh, that will depend on the evolution of the situation. So I, I don't know, but of course, I hope that I, I will be able to tra travel back uh, to China this year, yeah. Yeah, you haven't been back in how long? For two years, yeah. Two years. Susan Brownell, your thoughts about China, well, having a bubble inside of a country that's a bubble. Well, actually, even the 2008 Olympics sort of took place in a bubble as well. I mean, for one thing, the security around these events normally separates the athletes from the public to a large degree. So I think China has a lot of experience with this and also with um, bringing in pre-selected spectators. I mean, that has really just been very common in China, um, you know, for decades. So they, they do have a lot of experience in producing a sort of made-for-TV event. And frankly, um, many Olympic events are, are uh, made for TV anyway. And, um, you know, there may not be even many spectators in the stands of the less popular sports, and yet the TV cameras don't, uh, don't let you see that. So um, this is just really a more extreme version of what normally goes on. When you think back to the significance of the 2008 Games, what were your thoughts when you heard that China was getting the Games again for the Winter Olympics? I think I was surprised, like a lot of people were. Um, the significance of the 2008 Games was just so clear, because for 100 years it had been sort of an article of faith that hosting an Olympic Games would be a symbol that China had taken its place as an equal on the world stage with the other strong nations of the world. And that was a, a major effort in 2008. That was um, the meaning that was attributed to it by China and the rest of the world sort of believed China and saw it that way. And so the significance of a second Games is not nearly as clear. 
And frankly, I don't think they planned to win in 2015 when they bid, because normally it takes at least one bid, you know, before um, a successful bid is put forward. So they were probably a little bit surprised also. All right. And, you know, we're, we're talking about uh, the logistics issues. Uh, it's the kind of thing you talk about before the events have actually uh, begun. Once the competition begins, as, uh, as Susan was saying, uh, the focus then becomes on the results. Now, there's plenty of cold weather in Yangqing, which is uh, to the northwest of Beijing, uh, but not much precipitation. The snow is all artificial. Let's ask the skier in, on this panel. Uh, Florence Mazdana, the, the fact that it's all artificial snow, athletes adapt to that? Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, even in Europe, all the resorts have artificial snow. So sometimes it's mixed with natural snow, most of the time. But uh, but every every resort have, uh, you need at this day to have artificial snow, and the races are on most of the time on artificial snow, mixed sometimes with with water because we really need some hard and very hard hard um, hard surface. So we need ice, and so artificial snow. It's kind of uh, with a minus ten or minus twenty as they have there. It's uh, it's quite good. All the athletes said the conditions are perfect, but of course to organize something like that on a place where there is no no not not natural no natural snow, and uh, I heard not that much water. It's quite. Uh, questioning. Yeah, I, I would like to add that in previous um, Winter Olymp Olympics, you know, four years ago, 90% uh, of the snow was uh, artificial as well. And we can also look at the way um, that China has used to collect uh, the water. It, it, it has been based on the snow and also based on, on the rain and also based uh, with the water from so the natural the, lake. Capturing the rain. Right, uh, right. also natural lake. Uh, at the foot of the mountain, and the electricity used uh, is um, based on the wind uh, energy to to make the artificial. Uh, Sh Charles artificial Perrin, have, you, have you were you able to test the venues? Did you go skiing? I did you? actually. I've skied for the first time in my life because I'm not a skier at all. I was skied in Zhang Jiaqo in the, this Chongli Resort, which is being used, I, I believe, for the for the high jump, uh, long jump, sorry, uh, events, and um, it was. I mean, I'm an, as a novice, it was an extremely pleasant experience, and uh, and the fun part is actually is you're in a country where everyone's basically learning to ski, so everyone's at the beginner level, and it's sort of a fun atmosphere. But it is completely uh, foreign to this this sort of infrastructure in this northeastern uh, region of China, which is actually one of the poorest of of the country. It's kind of a completely uh, uh, feels off kilter, it feels a, like a strange sight to see these resorts there. Um, but uh, it's sort of catching on and the, the, the resorts were functioning. Susan Brownell, you, you posted pictures of yourself uh, visiting the, uh, the venues when they were being built. Uh, is there the feeling with winter sports, and you just heard Xiao mention how uh, everyone's a beginner at, 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 at skiing right now, it seems, uh, uh, that if you build it, they will come? I think that's probably the, the assumption, and actually I think it's probably right, because skiing in East Asia in general, including Japan and also in China, has um, for decades symbolized a sort of elite cosmopolitan Western lifestyle, you know, the après ski lifestyle. Um, and, I, and, and I think that there um, is this idea that if China can build up a few luxurious resorts, that it's a symbol that it's taking part you know, in, in this sort of global circuit of ski resorts that elites like to um, patronize. And, you know, with China's economic development, there is a, glowing, a growing class of such cosmopolitan elites in Beijing who uh, probably learn to ski in other countries. And so I think the likelihood that they will take those high speed trains out to the new venues and really um, use them in large numbers is is high and that it really could contribute to the quality of life of these people who now have a little bit of money and a little bit of leisure time. So I, I think the building of these resorts could be a popular move um, with a, a decent, you know, a fairly influential um, segment of the populace. By the way, the, the Olympic Village already has uh, sporting royalty, or at least a celebrity couple, Norwegian skier Alexander Amot Kilda, asked if he had Valentine's Day plans with American double Olympic champion uh, Michaela Schifrin. 
haven't thought about that. Uh, yeah, it's going to be with my roommate, I guess. <laughs> no, stay in the, stay in the bubble. Um, no, I think... Uh, is it 14th, right? 14th? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> 14th, so I, I don't know if I'm even going to be here. Uh, but if I am, of course, um, we'll see. Florence Mazdana, since you're here, I have to ask you, are, are, are those the people everyone's going to be watching in the skiing? Sorry? Uh, is, is it going to be Amot and Schifrin that everyone's going to be watching in the skiing? Who, who are going to be the big celebrities, if you will, of, this, uh, of these Olympics, and at least on the alpine skiing front? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you picked the right one. <laughs> I think, yeah, they're, they're, they're the stars and there is a, a love story. So it's going to be, uh, I think, and I hope the, the story of the Games. And uh, it's going to be nice. They are very happy to be together. They are sharing their story and their love story on the on the um, social media and uh, they are very incredible athletes so i think they're going to be the stars of the games they're going to be the stars of the games uh chun yan lee uh every olympics there's some local hero who's where do you where are you looking for a local hero during these uh, games there was a girl whose name is gu ailing right <laughs> and she has attracted much attention in china because uh um, she was born in the uh, United States, and uh, she decided to change her pass uh, passport. Uh, yeah, several years ago. Uh, Which to, sport is this? This is um, skiing, uh, snowboarding. I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If I remember well, and uh, she has already got many fans uh, in, in China. So uh, actually, skiing is not yet a very popular sport in China, but there are growing interest uh, in that. I have already observed that on the Chinese social media, for example, on uh, uh, Chinese TikTok, there are more and more videos about pe people uh, practicing skiing, and also it's clear uh, encouraged uh, to um, have more uh, sports installation in China and uh, uh, to get more people practicing the winter sports. Uh, it's even uh, written, you know, in the 15th uh, five-year plan uh, in China. And I think uh, this is also an opportunity for the Chinese people to discover more the winter sports and to make them uh, they more interested, make them more interested in the winter sports. Yeah. The objective was to reach over 300 million practitioners of winter sports uh, by the time that the Winter Olympics came. And according to the, da the data released by the uh, organizing committee, that's been surpassed. However, the calculation method shows that a lot of these people are who people who tried it once. Uh, but nonetheless, this is still the beginning of something. And I, I do think that there is definitely a market there amongst uh, the, the middle and upper middle class of people that are willing to to take up that hobby. All right, Susan Brownell talking earlier about how uh, the uh, it's also a coming of age uh, of an upper middle class, if you will, uh, inside of China. What else has changed since 2008 is relations have grown more tense uh, with the West. A tightening of the screws in Hong Kong, a massive crackdown of the Uyghur minority in Xinjiang province, where Coca-Cola, for instance, is a bottling plant. Coke, one of the major sponsors, uh, of uh, the Olympics in the past year. Brands like Nike and H&M removed their websites uh, 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 from their websites. Concern about forced labor in Xinjiang after a consumer boycott in China. The Financial Times uh, reporting how some companies such as uh, Nike have remained silent about human rights in China, even as they promote social justice campaigns over in the U.S. Uh, so you're in the U.S., Susan Brownell. Let me ask you, uh, are we going to hear not much, not at all about politics? It's going to be all about sports over the next fortnight? Well, there has really been a huge uh, media frenzy leading up to the games. Um, actually, it seems quite similar to 2008 when I think people have perhaps forgotten the extent of the political pressure on China in 2008 also. And one reason they've forgotten, I think, is that once that spectacular opening ceremony took place, uh, that, that was really what remained in the popular memory, as well as the incredible sports performances. So I think this is typical for all Olympic Games, although most Olympic Games aren't as controversial as this one. Um, but, you know, it is typical that once the sports start, that is really what people pay attention to, and that's what they remember when it's all over.
It is big business, the Olympics, and the Olympic movement gets nearly three quarters of its revenue from broadcast rights. Uh, one broadcaster in particular rules the roost. That's U.S. television network NBC, which has been in the crosshairs of lawmakers in Washington. Let's listen. We cannot let anyone forget about what is happening in communist China. NBC must use the Olympics to highlight these atrocities. Sadly, I doubt they will. Susan Brownell, your reaction to that? Well, I would say that something that is a little bit different compared to 2008 is the targeted pressure on the broadcasters and corporations. So they're, um, they're, they are now under pressure to take a stance and do something more so than they were in the past. And that's also coming not just from governments, but from non-governmental organizations and from the International Olympic Committee itself, which has, for example, now written uh, in, into future host city contracts there um, is a, a, like, um, a, a human rights clause that requires that supplier corporations and sponsors have um, fair labor practices throughout their entire supply chain. So th this is um, a changing landscape that will be interesting to trace in the future. And I do think that this could be an indirect way in which governments like China's could be put under pressure in a, in a way that things like, like the diplomatic boycott, for example, boycotts have been famously ineffective in bringing about political reforms in any country, and probably this one will be ineffective too. But this pressure on the broadcasters and the corporations is a different tactic, and maybe it will be more effective. Shah Pelgan, your thoughts on this, this with this circle, because you have the host nation, you've got the Olympic movement, and you have the sponsors. There's an interesting difference, again, between 2008 and 2022 now, which is uh, China's standing in the world, which has completely changed how these games have been organized. In 2008, there was a process of cons consultation and negotiation that went into organizing the games. Uh, I don't know if you remember that the, these uh, specific protest uh, zones had been, uh, had been organized within Beijing, where people were purportedly uh, allowed to protest. And uh, in the lead up to the Olympics, foreign journalists in China had managed to negotiate being allowed to go to other provinces in the country without seeking authorization from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. This was China trying to showing that it was a willing participant in uh, the the in, in the world in the in the world community, trying to uh, to work together. And we saw the, the opening ceremony in 2008 with uh, George Bush in the stands. But this time around, it's a completely different uh, situation. And really, Beijing has set the terms. Uh, human rights were never uh, part of the contract or the organize of the organization of the organizing committee, uh, and, and even if it's part of the of the IOC charter. Uh, uh, really, this is the Olympics of China showing that it's setting the term and it's not going to apologize about how it does things or its particular governance model. What's riding on this for Xi Jinping? I mean, it's this, it's what's writing with everything he does. He wants to show that, uh, that, 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 that China's model is uh, potentially not just the superior model, but also the one that works for this country and that he's going to be unapologetic about it and about the choices that it's made. It's about an, an, ideal, an ideology that he really truly believes in uh, that is uh, sort of a challenge or at least a different path to what's been uh, proposed in the liberal world order and, and by the United States over the past 100 years or so or less than that. Uh, it's, uh, it's about um, China's standing in the world and a certain ideology and a certain governance model. Shen Yanli? Uh, I think for me, it's first of, uh, of all uh, a sports uh, festival for all the athletes uh, without going into the details of uh, all the political issues, which are quite complicated and which can take hours for discussion. I think we shouldn't uh, polit politicize the Olympic Games because... Olympics it's are always <laughs> political. 1992 was the yeah. celebration of Spain coming out of the Franco era. If we look at, they, uh, I mean, why we have created uh, such games, you know, the Olympic uh, spirit is friendship, um, uh, is uh, solidarity, uh, is a fair play. So for me, it's an occasion uh, for, for that different people coming from different countries and of different profiles can gather, gather together, together sorry, uh, to compete in a peaceful um, atmosphere. And if but we you wave national flags, and what people look at is the medal table to yeah, see but how we your country is doing. But we can, we can find, find peace in such kind of game because games. Because if we delete that, you know, 
reduce that, what would we get? More conflicts and more tensions. And by the way, I just want to highlight that, you know, if we talk about uh, Xinjiang or other political uh, topics, I think we also should have uh, taken into uh, consideration um, the um, uh, terrorism and the separatism uh, in Xinjiang, and also the geopolitical games between China and the USA. Uh, and it's quite complicated. So I just want to highlight that, that we need to be very careful, uh, you know, uh, in checking the facts. Susan, Susan Brownell, yeah. when you hear people saying, don't mix sports and politics, what's your reaction? Well, I personally think it was good for China and good for the world in 2008 that China hosted an Olympic Games. And I think the same thing will be true this time. I think it bring, it draws China into you know greater engagement with the international community. It uh, gives it a reality check in terms of the public and um, political opinion of it in the outside world. So, I mean, I'm actually in favor of it. And I think it would be great if China and other so-called dictatorships hosted more Olympic Games. I do think, though, that this um, current furor could give us the wrong impression that we're entering another new Cold War. And I think it's important to realize that this is happening at the level of political gamesmanship and rhetoric, and that the reality is that China is quickly becoming more integrated into the world community than it ever has been. And, and there are things going on at this games that really indicate that. And I would just return to Eileen Gu, who was mentioned earlier. This will be the first um, Olympic Games at which China has, um, th there, was, there was one athlete in Tokyo, and now there will be several who were born and raised in other countries and are now going to represent China. And China has not has been lagging in doing that. That's a practice quite common around the world, you know, citizenship switching of athletes. But because of xenophobia in China, it it lagged behind in joining that practice. And I actually think the fact that China is now jumping in and doing that with, um, you know, full steam ahead actually shows that the xenophobia is lessening and China is assimilating into international sports culture and. It's just becoming a normal member of the community. You, you might miss that if you pay too much attention to the political rhetoric. But we live in an age where uh, athletes speak out more than ever uh, on political issues. Uh, we saw it uh, uh, in the past year with stars like Naomi Osaka. Now, let's take the example of basketball. It's not a Winter Olympic sport, but when it comes to the crackdown against the Muslim minority in Xinjiang, Boston Celtics center Enes Kanter, who's of Turkish origin, did not hold back in a recent interview with France 24's Mark Perlman. I believe, you know, diplomatic boycott is good, but it's not enough, you know. And um, I believe, you know, there has to be a, another, you know, some actions need, uh, needs to be uh, taken. But I believe, you know, the athlete needs to come out there and said enough is enough and we need to uh, bring our voice into this conversation, because they are going to be the one that's going to make the real change. Florence Mazdana, your reaction? Uh, sometimes, you know, when I hear um, organization or government asking the athletes to say, OK, you have to boycott, it's not good there because of the human rights. What? Why are you going to compete in uh, Beijing, for example? You know what? I am angry. Because they, are, they want to use the image of the athletes. And one week before, they didn't even know the, the name of the athletes. So if the athletes feel and think that they have to play a role, just go and play the role and say what you want. But don't, I, I, I don't want uh, them to be used by, by people. If they, they are not, the athletes are not able to resolve, to solve problems that the government or the organization were working in, in this that kind of the human right, they are not, we are not able to, um, to solve. All right, Florence, that's if you're getting orders from above. If you've been training your whole life to go to the Olympics and uh, you're then told you can't go by your government. But what about the case where you might have an athlete, and we saw it most famously at the 1968 Olympics, uh, with those uh, uh, those athletes from the United States who raised the black fist, uh, the, the black gloved fist uh, for civil rights. What if an athlete gets up on the podium during a medal ceremony and uh, shows a T-shirt that says "Free Xinjiang" and it's a personal personal initiative? 
yeah, I think they're going to have some problems. <laughs> Because when you enter to the games, you have to sign a kind of declaration, and you uh, and you say that you you are not able to uh, to to save and to man to do to 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 show your um, your op political opinion during the especially the the medal ceremony. So um, I think it's very tough. It's very tough. But uh, the athletes uh, they are here to compete and to show. And then if after they want to. Uh, to show and to work for organization, for human rights, and to show their values that they are not, but uh, they can do it. But during the games, it's going to be. Are, are you sensing a change among athletes now that they all have their own followings on social media? We saw uh, in the past year uh, uh, in football with Black Lives Matter, uh, there was uh, a lot of athletes who were speaking out more than before. Uh, we've seen other causes where uh, professional athletes ha ha have spoken out. Uh, are today's athletes, fr France Mazdana, are they different from when you were competing? Yeah, for sure. For sure. They have, uh, w the athletes today have uh, um, a voice, a voice that can be heard. Before, we, did, we, we were just like a few, a few, uh, a few few uh, supporters or no we didn't count very much their their, their voice counts today and you can find athletes in uh, organization like uh, in paris 2024 with uh, tony estangue and other guys and uh, before in london so they have they have a role to play but during the games i think it's it's not very allowed uh, and it's uh, it's yeah i think it's um, it's odd it's odd because if you really believe in something you have to and to uh, to tell people what you are thinking and if you are not uh, r um, agree with some um, rules or something you have to tell them but during the games you it's dangerous for for your middle can, can I just add one point I, I I agree that the athlete, athletes shouldn't be used as a tools as a tool uh, for the interest uh, interests of the politicians. And uh, you know, I have been living in France for more than 18 years, and I have discussed a, a lot about China with my French uh, friends, with the Westerners. I often have the feeling that it's very difficult to understand the real China, you know, in both sense. So uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, um, the, the, the athletes, uh, you know, it's not their job, you know, they, they, maybe they don't really know very well the different geopolitical issues. And, uh, but if they feel strongly about an issue, should they be able to speak up? They, they should, but I think hmm. uh, if we have already decided to go to the Olympic Games, I don't think they want to raise uh, these well, political actually, Rule 50 topics, of the Olympic yeah. Charter actually now has been slightly accommodated to, uh, to allow some athletes to express uh, political statements within very specific parameters. So uh, the IOC has heard some of these discussions we've heard in the sports world about uh, social justice, etc. And actually in Tokyo, uh, I can't remember her name, but uh, the shot put champion uh, from the United States raised a fist and she was not penalized for it. And this reflects a change of rules. So there's going to be an interesting contradiction here in Beijing if someone, if one athlete decides, uh, hopefully of their own volition, to make a statement, if, if there's going to be between the Rule 50 that accommodates this political statement and the fact that this athlete will be in China and will need to abide by Chinese laws, which um, can be used to uh, sort of repress free speech. Susan Brownell, is this what keeps Chinese authorities up at night, the fear that uh, live on television uh, one of these athletes might uh, do something uh, in solidarity with a cause? You know, that was a, actually a pretty big fear in 2008, and there were, were a lot of restrictions um, that, for example, really tight control of Tiananmen Square, which had been um, considered to be a likely pace, place for protest. So, you know, yes, um, I mean, I'm not in China now. I, I would guess that there's a little bit of the same fear. But since 2008, um, we've seen uh, more of a sort of a systematic approach to this on the part of the International Olympic Committee. And now, um, as the previous uh, guest mentioned, there is um, athletes are allowed to make political statements in press conferences, but they are, are forbidden from doing so on the podium. 
I mean, we, we have now had this figure of the activist athlete, as they're called, emerging in the U.S., although in the U.S. it's typically um, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and, you know, in opposition to discrimination. So it's not just any issue that has created these activist athletes. And that is sort of an image or a brand that some athletes can take on. But in, in all of the cases I'm aware of, these are athletes who are protesting against conditions in their own country that directly well, affect Well, you heard them. Ennis Kanter there, the, the basketball player, talking about Xinjiang. Uh, you know, that was a little bit unusual. But of course, you know, he's an NBA player. And so, you know, the Olympics aren't exactly his platform to begin with. It might be different if, you know, that was primarily, you know, his, his power base, if you will. Um, I think... We, we might see a few such protests, but um, historically, you know, also in 2008, also in Tokyo, um, we really didn't see the amount of protests that we um, expected uh, regard in which an athlete is um, expressing protest on behalf of something going on in another country that does d d not directly affect that athlete. So I would guess the same thing would be true now, that if we get protests, it will be um, Black Lives Matter protests or, you know, um, more directly related to what's going on in the athlete's home country. One final question. Shun Yan Lee, uh, yeah. uh, I hear China's president has taken a liking to one of my favorite sports, ice hockey. Is that true? Uh, yeah, yes, uh, but I think uh, China is at the beginning, you know, for this game. Okay, and so they're not going to win any medals. This um, I think the most important for them is to to learn, also to learn, you know, from from the athletes of other countries, and to uh, let China people discover more this report, and to get growing interest in that. Uh, I think that's more important than winning or, or not. Of course, I hope that they will win. Yeah, but, but we are still in the Most learning stage. Most important is to participate. Chun Yan Li, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank, thank as well uh, Charles Pellegrin, Susan Brownell in St. Louis, uh, Florence Mazdana for being with us. Have a good Olympics. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, there's more to come on France 24. Thanks for being with us.